Hey guys, today I'll show you a sci-fi horror TV series named Dark, Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins half a year after the missing person cases at the small German town of Winden. Nielsen, Jonas, and old Helga have vanished in the 2019 timeline. Jonas's mother, Hannah, who has lost her husband, son, and lover in succession, living each day in a state of exhaustion. Unable to bear her painful life any longer, she decides to end it all with a gun. But she's then visited by a dirty man, who manages to convince Hannah that he is indeed her handsome son, the adult Jonas coming from the future. Tears streaming down, Hannah embraces her long-lost son. Adult Jonas tells Hannah that young Jonas is currently in a future timeline, and despite his efforts, he cannot bring him back. When Hannah asks why adult Jonas stays in this timeline, he glances at the floor with eyes full of sorrow and pain. Then, looking at his mother resolutely, he says that he's here to put an end to all of this chaos. Adult Jonas sleeps on his bed. Hannah watches his scarred back, wanting to touch it but afraid to reach out. Meanwhile, the town's hotel owner, Regina's condition, remains grim, even after the cancer chemotherapy. However, having her husband and son by her side gives her the strength to carry on. Officer Nielsen's daughter, Martha, arranges a meeting with Bartosz, while both families endure pain over the past six months. Regardless of her children, Nielsen's wife, Kathy, enters the Winden Cave every day with equipment, mapping every path inside, bearing the pain and desperation in hopes of finding her husband and missing son, Mikkel. Martha senses that her current boyfriend, Bartosz, is hiding something from her. Regardless of her pressing, he never mentions Noah to her, even attributing her restlessness to the disappearance of Jonas. They officially break up because of that. Although Bartosz wants to reconcile with Martha, he receives a text from Noah saying, It's tonight. On the other hand, Nielsen's older son, Magnus, grew closer with Franziska. However, even during their dates, Franziska would leave abruptly upon receiving a call. This makes Magnus anxious. He couldn't resist following his girlfriend to see what she's up to. Franziska arrives at the deserted railway in the forest, secretly places an envelope in a metal box, and hides it under the tracks before leaving. From a distance, Magnus watches like a peeping Tom, waiting to see who will collect the envelope. After a long wait, he finally sees a person retrieve the box and take out the envelope, then put their envelope inside. This person is the cross-dresser. Magnus doesn't recognize the cross-dresser and can only secretly follow them to a flashy trailer. Gathering his courage, Magnus enters the trailer, only to find out that the cross-dresser makes a living by selling his body. This scares him, and he runs away. Over the past six months, Kathy has always stayed in her missing son Mikkel's room, locking it whenever she goes out. When Martha comes home, she finds the door open. She walks into her brother's room and sees all the information her father had collected. When Magnus comes home, the siblings immediately start studying the materials and understand why their mother has been visiting the Winden Cave every day. She's looking for a door to the time passage. Under government policy, the town's nuclear power plant is set to permanently shut down in six days. The current plant director, Alec, delivers his final speech to the staff. Afterwards, he and his subordinates, donning protective suits, enter the workshop. They decide to bury all nuclear waste under cement. Blindfold Man pays Crossdresser a sum of money, thanking him for helping to guard the nuclear waste in the container. At first, it appears their relationship is purely transactional. However, before leaving, Blindfold Man reminds Crossdresser to call his mother and gives him a deep hug, revealing they are brothers. As the nuclear waste barrels are covered layer by layer with cement, Alec finally feels relieved. After the nuclear power plant is dismantled and green plants cover the land, the nuclear waste will become a forever secret. An investigator arrives in Winden and takes over all the missing person cases. However, the townspeople have long lost faith in the police. Inside the police station, the investigator tries to pry out the last message Nielsen left for Officer Charlotte, but she keeps mum about such a mysterious matter. Undeterred, the investigator sits at Charlotte's desk, urging her to review the files together. As the night deepens, Charlotte suddenly receives a text from her husband Peter, stating that he has found Noah. Understanding the seriousness of the situation, she immediately leaves the investigator. Earlier in the day, Peter brought his deaf and mute daughter Elizabeth to the clock shop to tidy up the clutter. The clockmaker is Charlotte's grandfather. She hasn't seen her parents since she was very young and she was raised by her grandfather. Among the clockmaker's collection, Elizabeth finds an old photo. The man in the photo is unmistakably Noah. 
Charlotte and her husband Peter meet in the bunker with the back of the photo dated January 8, 1921, stating, Thus the world was created. However, Charlotte has never seen the man in the photo. The couple look at each other in bewilderment. The scene shifts to June 21, 1921. At this time, the space-time tunnel in the Winden Cave has not been built. Two shirtless men are laboriously carving out the space-time door. They seem to obey one man, Adam, who believes that paradise will come on June 27th and hell will end. The tattooed man questions these words. The young boy listens, then silently picks up the pickaxe and kills the tattooed man. This boy is actually a young Noah. This is his first time killing, but he has no regrets, because at this moment, Adam is his god. On the other side, middle-aged Noah flips open a brown notebook, which notes the start of the last cycle on June 27, 2020. He comforts the young Noah, advising him not to be puzzled by his current experiences, asserting that it's the past experiences that shape who he is now. He encourages him to trust his own voice. Noah's revered Adam is a disfigured old man who seems to be pulling Noah's strings from behind the scenes, plotting this time conspiracy. Now, he is working to ensure the occurrence of the apocalypse to reset the world. Many pages are missing from the brown notebook, and Adam commands Noah to find them. It's clear that this is a colossal organization led by Adam. At this moment, Jonas is living in the ruins of 2053 with his father's last letter. Every day, he wraps himself up tightly and scavenges for useful materials among the ruins, storing them in the bunker. The bunker contains the audio tapes of Claudia, the nuclear plant's former director, who mentioned that the apocalypse occurs on June 27, 2020, possibly caused by the God Particle. If it can be stabilized, perhaps people can return to the past to save everyone. Looking at Martha's photo and necklace, Jonas decides he must return to the past. The area around the derelict nuclear power plant is filled with graves. Almost everyone he knew died in the apocalypse. Jonas places a family photo on his father's grave, taking a long look at his ex-lover Martha's tombstone. The forest is filled with hanged people, showing that this world also has its own form of authoritarian rule. In this future timeline, a deaf-mute woman nearly controls the lives of the remaining humans. Anyone who disobeys or tries to break into the power plant is ordered to be hanged by her, with a scarred woman acting as her spokesperson. Interestingly, this deaf-mute woman is the same Elizabeth in the 2019 timeline. Now middle-aged, she seems to have survived the apocalypse since then. She constantly preaches that God will save them, but Jonas doesn't care. He only wants to return to the past to save everyone. One night, Jonas evades all watchers, sneaking into the power plant. According to his signal detector, he arrives at the workshop where the nuclear waste was originally buried. The wall is etched with the same symbols as the space-time door. He puts on a protective suit and enters. Beyond the scattered documents lies a massive, constantly writhing energy body. On the other side, the missing boy Mikkel in the 2019 timeline has become the adopted son of Nurse Inez on June 22, 1987. Mikkel constantly misses his biological parents, feeling down. Fortunately, Nurse Inez is a gentlewoman who continually encourages him to cheer up. Mikkel tries to escape the influence of his past. However, once faced with a familiar yet strange school, he chooses to play truant and wanders alone in the forest. Suddenly, a strange fluctuation comes from the air. He immediately realizes this could be his chance to go home and quickly runs to the entrance of the Winden Cave, but he is stopped by Noah. Noah, once playing the role of a priest, had previously convinced Mikkel with the doctrine of God's destiny. Now, he is still preaching the same doctrine. Mikkel asks what if God is wrong. Noah firmly says that God cannot make mistakes and that they must believe that everything will turn around again. In the end, Mikkel just stares blankly at the cave entrance. Every day, Nurse Inez worries that Mikkel will suddenly disappear, just as he suddenly appeared. When she sees him return, she hugs her son emotionally, using love and tolerance to melt Mikkel's frightened heart. Eventually, Mikkel initiatively embraces his mother. In 2020, adult Jonas has taken out the time machine that will cause another disturbance in the forest. He had always kept the secret of time travel to himself, but now, fate refuses to let him go. Now he has to reveal this secret to others, combining everyone's strength to turn the tide of tragic fate. Adult Jonas takes Hannah to the Winden Cave and uses the mobile phone battery left by Nielsen years ago to start the time machine. Hannah watches his operation carefully. In an instant, the two arrive in 1987. This is the time-space disturbance that Mikkel sensed. When Hannah sees that Mikkel is really her husband, she can't help but cry. 
Adult Jonas hugs his mother, giving her courage. On June 22, 1987, not only is Mikkel living in fear, but Claudia is also having her worldview upended as she enters childhood. Her missing pet dog does not make her happy, but instead makes her feel that everything is strange. Work still has to be done. After all, as the current director, the busy work and secrets of the nuclear power plant make her stressed. For this, she has to ask her retired father, Sheriff Egon, to pick up and drop off her daughter, young Regina. Now, Regina has learned to dress herself and has started dating the young Alec. However, what troubles Regina the most is that she feels her mother doesn't love her. Sheriff Egon is very happy to drive his granddaughter, but he has been diagnosed with cancer and the cancer cells have spread. However, like all elderly parents facing their busy children, he chooses to keep it a secret. Claudia also doesn't notice. She takes her pet dog to work in a rush. Before Claudia enters the office, the secretary tells her someone is looking for her. This person is actually the old Claudia. The old Claudia calmly holds the pet dog and accurately predicts every word and action of the people in the nuclear power plant, successfully convincing Claudia that they are the same person. The old Claudia takes her younger self to the Winden Cave, where it's filled with nuclear waste. She shows her younger self the steps to start the time machine and describes the 33-year interval of time travel in detail. Most importantly, she says that everything will start again in five days and urges her to stop Adam. Young Claudia looks confused. She doesn't even know who Adam is. The old Claudia is not in a hurry. She hands a map, saying that if things go smoothly, she can survive. Then she starts the time machine and leaves. After a late night, Claudia, following the map left for her, has dug up her backyard. She finally unearths a time machine from a marked spot, the exact machine the old Claudia had buried back in 1954. Sheriff Egon's days are numbered. His only regret from his career as a policeman is his inability to solve the disappearance case of Nielsen's brother. Now, with boundless freedom, he can finally investigate based on his instinct. His prime suspect is Helga. However, since the car accident, Helga seems to have lost his lucidity, only repeatedly mentioning the time he was attacked by Nielsen during his childhood, and occasionally mentioning terms like white devil. Since Helga mentioned Nielsen, Sheriff Egon also recalls the terrifying but non-communicative man from over 30 years ago. Nielsen was accused of kidnapping little Helga and murdering two boys. He had been detained in a mental health facility since 1953, now it's 1987. Nielsen is living actively in the asylum. Upon seeing Sheriff Egon, he repeats the lyrics that his only goal is to take lives. Yet, Sheriff Egon still doesn't understand Nielsen and refuses to communicate with him further. The scene then shifts to the timeline in 2020. Officer Charlotte wanted to study Noah's photo carefully, but she was pulled away by the investigator to solve a case. They question the last witnesses of the disappearances of Nielsen's brother and Nielsen himself, the hotel owner, Regina. Rather than focusing on the case, the investigator always sidesteps to inquire about the current power plant director, Alec. Irritated by the change of topic, Regina hands over the stuff the adult Jonas left in the hotel. Charlotte quickly sifts through the contents of the box. Upon seeing many images related to time travel written by her grandfather, she immediately makes an excuse to leave and tells her husband Peter about it. Peter starts to believe in time travel. Looking at the photo only containing her and her grandfather, doubts about her parentless upbringing surface in her mind. The arriving Peter embraces his wife. They are still each other's most loyal support. However, problems arise between Franziska and Magnus. Magnus suspects his girlfriend, like the crossdresser, has been selling her body for money and angrily confronts her about it. However, Franziska often steals hormone therapy drugs from her doctor father Peter and sells them to the crossdresser, helping him maintain his female identity. His girlfriend indeed has not sold her body, but Magnus's distrustful attitude and behavior hurt Franziska deeply. She angrily slaps him and leaves. Magnus is left unsure of how to respond and can only leave in disgrace. Jonas in the 2053 timeline is determined to return to the past. The writhing energy mass in the nuclear power plant is a special system formed by God particles. By powering it up with a large amount of electricity, it can stabilize and enable time travel. The remaining power in the nuclear plant is insufficient. To resolve this, Jonas attempts to steal gasoline from the adult Elizabeth's team, barely escaping discovery. As he prepares to infiltrate the nuclear plant with the gasoline, he's captured by Elizabeth. 
According to their rules, Jonas is to be hanged. He has seen through Elizabeth's lies and knows there is no God to save them. Elizabeth hesitates not and shoots Jonas in the leg, then kicks over the gallows. At the last moment, Elizabeth softens and instead of hanging him, locks him away. At night, the scarred woman lets Jonas free. She wants him to take her to the nuclear power plant to see what's inside. The pair walk into the workshop, where the energy mass continues to writhe. Jonas pours the stolen gasoline into the start switch. The vast electricity does indeed calm the energy mass. Jonas shows no fear as he slowly approaches the energy mass. For his family and loved ones, he resolutely steps into it, hoping to return to 2020 to save his family. Jonas disappears into the energy mass, which afterward begins to move menacingly once more. As the plot unfolds, we learn that the time travelers split into two camps. The camp led by Adam seems to be continuously affirming fate and following its destined path. But Adam's purpose of doing that remains unknown. In contrast, Claudia's camp wants to keep fate on a certain path, then make a key change at a critical moment. Claudia does this primarily to save her daughter. The first season ended with a time-space handover. Jonas was sent to 2053, while little Helga was taken to 1987. After sacrificing several boys' lives, Noah finally succeeded in creating a time machine. Little Helga was attacked by Nielsen, which left a huge psychological shadow on him. Noah seized this opportunity to brainwash him, cultivating him into the future middle-aged Helga, who would aid and abet him. After the successful brainwashing, Noah activated the time machine. Little Helga, with the silver coin strung on a red string, returned to June 23, 1954. Helgi's mother was overjoyed to see her son return, revealing a rare motherly side. Meanwhile, Officer Egon is discussing marital relations with a colleague. Since they had a daughter, the couple hasn't had much time alone. Officer Egon vaguely senses that his wife shares some secret with a woman named Agnes, who is actually Nielsen's young grandmother. He's right. At this moment, his wife and Agnes are playing intimacy in the room, but all of this is seen by the young Claudia. During the discussion between Officer Egon and his colleague, news arrives that little Helga, missing for half a year, is finally home. Officer Egon rushes to Helga's family, but the returned Helga remains silent, his gloomy demeanor not at all like a normal child. Helga's mother becomes rigid again, even suspecting that her son is possessed by a demon. So she invites the priest Noah to her house. Little Helga immediately runs up to hug him and begins speaking under his guidance. The mother thinks a miracle has truly occurred. Noah subtly reminds the mother to take good care of little Helga before leaving. When Noah returns to the church, he is surprisingly met by Agnes. It turns out they are both time travelers and are siblings. Noah has always worked for Adam, but Agnes defected at some point and joined Claudia's camp. Agnes doesn't beat around the bush. She knows Adam and Noah have been looking for the last few pages of the brown notebook which are currently in the hands of the elderly Claudia. Agnes then hands her brother Noah a newspaper clipping, seemingly revealing information about Claudia. She betrays Claudia on one condition that she wants to return to Adam's camp. Having said that, Agnes keeps the newspaper clipping and leaves with a flourish. In fact, all of this is within the plans of the elderly Claudia. Earlier on, she had arranged to meet Agnes in the bunker, handing her a newspaper clipping that reported her own death. The date is today. Claudia is grateful to Agnes for being on her side. More importantly, her mother loves Agnes. If they were to be together, both her mother and Agnes would attain happiness. The elderly Claudia embraces Agnes before leaving. Knowing her own death is imminent, she calmly accepts this reality. She visits the police station intending to see her young father, Officer Egon, for the last time. Although Officer Egon doesn't recognize the elderly woman standing before him, he feels a familiar sense of kinship upon seeing her strange eyes, which are just like his daughter's. Tearfully, the elderly Claudia tells him that he is a good man, but too good for this world, before repeatedly apologizing to him. Officer Egon is left bewildered. Officer Egon hasn't had a good day. When he returns home from work, he brings a bouquet of flowers, hoping to redeem his precarious marriage. However, he finds his wife has gone out. He can only chat with his daughter, sharing the strange encounter with the elderly woman. Seeing the flowers her father has brought home, the young Claudia understands her mother's infidelity. She can only console her father gently, saying the same line that he is a good man but too good for this world. However, these words only frighten Officer Egon. 
The elderly Claudia then visits the clock shop. The young clockmaker is still studying the time machine but always misses the point. Claudia isn't bothered, knowing that this machine will only be fully functional after 33 years. She hands the clockmaker a book about time travel, reassuring him that even though he doesn't understand anything now, he will meet someone in the future who will teach him. Having settled all her affairs, Claudia finally meets Noah. Noah is willing to be manipulated by Adam, not only because he was brainwashed, but also because he believes Claudia took everything from him. Claudia mocks Noah, saying that he is merely a pawn in the game between her and Adam. Even the current situation has been arranged by her. The beautiful future Adam painted for Noah is nothing more than an illusion. Noah hesitates for a bit, but still follows the course of history, shooting and killing the elderly Claudia. He then finds the missing pages of the notebook on her body. The content, however, leaves him devastated. He yells, this can't be true, inadvertently mentioning Charlotte's name. When Adam learns about the elderly Claudia's death, he verbally expresses that she got what she deserved while his eyes are filled with tears. Noah, whose faith seems shattered, quietly hides the fact that he found the missing pages of the notebook. In the timeline of June 23, 1987, the middle-aged Claudia looks at the unearthed time machine, unsure of what to do. Her thoughts are interrupted by the voice of her daughter. Remembering the words of the elderly Claudia, she realizes that if time travel is real, she is destined to part with her daughter for a long time. Unable to resist, she embraces her daughter, who has always craved her mother's love. At this moment of embrace, her daughter's expression softens instantly. After sending her daughter away, Claudia recalls a book on time travel that Helga gave her the previous year. She immediately finds Helga with the book, but unfortunately, Helga's mind isn't as clear as before. But he warns her to never trust Noah. Left with no other choice, Claudia seeks out the author of the book, the elderly clockmaker. The elderly clockmaker isn't surprised by her arrival. In contrast to his younger self filled with anxiety and unease, he has now seemingly surrendered to fate, immune to surprises. He begins to explain time travel to Claudia and carefully instructs her on how to use the time machine. Meanwhile, Sheriff Egon finally finds the lyrics that Nielsen constantly mutters in a record issued last year. He confronts Nielsen, who finally reveals his name and his secret about time travel. However, Nielsen is not related to the White Devil. Sheriff Egon finds a police report from when Mikkel first arrived in town and suspects that Nielsen is looking for his son. He immediately goes to question Nurse Inez, but she dismisses him on the pretext that Mikkel has already gone to sleep. However, the sleeping pills not properly hidden on the table suggest that there's more to the story. Eventually, Sheriff Egon gets a picture of Mikkel. With his investigation not making any progress, he visits his daughter's office. Claudia is stressed with the matter of time travel and is visibly distant and impatient with her uninvited father. Sheriff Egon, accommodating his daughter, calmly informs her that he has been diagnosed with cancer. Not knowing what to say, Claudia gives her father a hug. Sheriff Egon is taken aback. It's been many years since his daughter has shown him any affection. He hugs her back. Sheriff Egon once again visits the mental health facility, tells Nielsen about Mikkel, and shows him the picture. Even after 33 years, Nielsen recognizes his son instantly. However, the pain of those 33 years erupts, and he angrily chokes Sheriff Egon, blaming him for not telling him sooner. Medical staff immediately intervene. At night, Claudia goes to the Winden Cave alone, activates the time machine, and arrives in the year 2020. In the bright sunlight, she sees her beloved daughter, the hotel owner Regina, looking frail. Claudia can't help but shed tears. The elderly clockmaker had mentioned the bootstrap paradox to her. In essence, when an object is sent from the future to the past, it creates an endless cycle. The object no longer has a true origin, it exists, but it was never created just like the book on time travel. To the future, the book is written by the clockmaker, but it was given to him by someone from the future, and the clockmaker just copied and published it. So who wrote the book? All questions boil down to the origin, hinting that to know the answer, we should find the moment when time travel originated. As a review here, Adam and Claudia are both waiting for the end of the world, each with their own agenda. Everyone else seems to be just pawns in their game. They continue to travel through time, influencing the unaware according to the predetermined course of history, leading them step by step towards their predestined future. The middle-aged Claudia is obviously a time travel novice. It's still unclear what had made her ultimately become the leader, the elderly Claudia, and accept her imminent death, and what shocking secret is recorded in the missing notebook pages that Noah found.
In the timeline of June 24, 2020, three days until the end of the world, Charlotte has taken sick leave from the police station and stays in the clock shop to study her grandfather's legacy. As she first sees the blueprints for the time machine, Hannah suddenly calls. The adult Jonas accidentally found a gun and ID card and realized that Hannah was extorting someone. Incredibly, he confronts Hannah, feeling that she's not like his mother anymore. Hannah retorts that the adult Jonas is not her young son Jonas either. While she logically knows the adult Jonas is her son, she hopes more for her young son to return. Torn, she decides to notify Charlotte and tells her everything she knows. In disbelief, Charlotte looks at the adult Jonas, a living example of time travel right in front of her. Perhaps she knows what's up with Noah. Charlotte pulls out the photo left by her grandfather. Adult Jonas recognizes Noah in it, and everyone in the photo is a time traveler. They all belong to the Sick Mundus organization, and Adam, in the center, is their leader. Realizing she's on to a breakthrough with time travel, Charlotte takes them to the bunker inside the Winden Cave. The bunker walls are plastered with information. Hannah stares blankly at the 1953 report of Nielsen's arrest. Peter hands the brown notebook to adult Jonas. It was given by the elderly Claudia. It records all the times when boys went missing and many incidents of time travel, but the last few pages are still blank. Unable to draw conclusions, the four of them take a break. Hannah thinks of the information about the missing Mikkel and Nielsen, and of Kathy who is in pain. She decides to share this information with her. Charlotte drives to pick up Kathy. She only tells her that Nielsen and Mikkel are still alive. Kathy breaks into tears and willingly goes to the bunker. Excited, Kathy rushes into the bunker. The first person she sees, however, is Hannah, whom she dislikes. The newspapers on the wall and the explanations from everyone make Kathy realize that what separates her from her husband and son is not space, but time, something that can't be crossed in the conventional sense. The stranger in front of her, adult Jonas, even claims to be Hannah's son. Kathy's rational mind can't accept this, and she quickly leaves this suffocating place. However, driven by emotion, she goes to the school archive and finds her missing son, Mikkel, in the 1987 student photo. Kathy breaks down crying. Back in the bunker, the four of them sit in a row. Peter doesn't know what to do next. After all, he's just been a bystander from the beginning. Regardless of whether others understand or not, adult Jonas has to uphold the mission of the elderly Claudia and prevent Adam from triggering the end of the world in three days. They all fail to notice that Hannah is staring strangely at the information on the wall. Without Charlotte as the driver, the investigator hitched a ride with Blindfold Man straight to the nuclear power plant, seeking information about the missing persons case from the plant director, Alec. Naturally, Alec completely disassociated himself from the case. After a few questions, the investigator again started to probe why Alec had married into his wife's family and taken her surname. The most crucial question was, what was Alec's original surname? When he heard Alec's original name, the investigator's face clearly changed, but he left calmly. Alec was left in confusion, and Blindfold Man couldn't give him any hints. Within just a few days of interactions, the investigator began to sense the undercurrents flowing beneath the small town. It seemed the entire town was filled with lies, disloyalty, and betrayal. Every resident had unspeakable secrets. Even Blindfold Man driving the car, his eye covered by the black blindfold, seemed to hide something. He originally intended to reveal the secret of the blindfold, but almost ran into a woman. The woman, without stopping, hurried away. This woman was actually the middle-aged Claudia who came through time. She originally came to the power plant looking for her older self, but was told that the current director is her son-in-law, Alec. Then she went to the library to check her status during this era, only to find that she was listed as missing. However, she didn't care. She also checked her daughter's information, and seeing her daughter grow from an annoying kid to a mature hotel owner, she felt a surge of pride. Upon finding out that her father, Sheriff Egon, would die in his residence on June 26, 1987, she immediately printed out the report and rushed to Winden Cave, wanting to return to her own timeline immediately, but almost getting hit by a car. While the adults are out sharing information of the time travel, Franziska took her mute sister to Magnus's house. The couple, who had previously quarreled, strangely reconciled. 
The youth group noticed the strange behavior of their parents and sensed something was wrong, so they decided to take action themselves, going to Winden Cave in search of answers. As they were wandering around the cave following the map, they bumped into Bartosz. Magnus grabbed him first, and the three boys and girls tied up his hands and feet, interrogating him about his sudden appearance in the cave, and even suspecting him of being involved in the disappearance of Nielsen and Mikkel. Martha opened the box Bartosz carried, which contained a time machine. However, no one knew what it was other than Bartosz, who kept his lips sealed and refused to disclose the purpose of the machine. At the critical moment, Martha decided to leave him in the cave to fend for himself, planning to starve him for a day and a night and see if he'd speak the truth then. No matter how much Bartos pleaded, Martha left with the other three. That night, Bartos struggled alone in the cave, calling for help in a desperate chicken voice. Meanwhile, Kathy looked at the photos of Mikkel from two different eras, not knowing what to say. She couldn't share her burden with her children. Francisca and her sister Elizabeth looked around their empty home, their parents still not home. Hannah looked at the bunker thoughtfully, while the investigator wrote the name of Alec in the most prominent position on the case whiteboard. Claudia, who had returned to the past, silently covered her sleeping daughter with a blanket. This day was just like any other, but it was also a day that promised to change many people's lives. As shown earlier, the young Jonas walked into the energy body and disappeared, finally appearing in a wheat field. Traveling through time and space didn't feel pleasant, and the bullet wound in his leg made him look miserable. Two passing farmers took him to the town. Seeing the townspeople's attire and the architectural style of the town, Jonas felt fearful. The lady at the town inn took pity on Jonas. Her daughter turned out to be the childhood Agnes, and Jonas was shocked to find himself in the year 1921. After a good meal and a full night's sleep, his wounds were treated. Sitting by his bedside was none other than young Noah. The Jade record was hanging on the wall. Jonas didn't have time to think. He immediately packed his belongings and headed for the Winden Cave, wanting to return to the right timeline. He opened the iron door to the time-space crossing with hope, but at the end of the tunnel was just a stone wall. When Jonas walked out of the cave in despair, young Noah had been waiting for him for a long time and told him that the tunnel would open in 32 years. After saying this, young Noah took Jonas to the church where adult Noah was waiting for him. Under their guidance, Jonas came deep underground and met the leader of the Sick Mundus organization, Adam. Adam looked completely different. He said it was because the human body couldn't withstand the cost of multiple time-space crossings. Jonas didn't want to listen to Adam's preaching, but Adam was calm. When he asked about Adam's identity, Adam unbuttoned his high collar to reveal a clear hanging mark on his neck and said, I am you. It's hard to imagine that Jonas, who embodies the spirit of Claudia and wants to stop Adam, is actually confronting his older self. After experiencing so much, Adam chose to confront his younger self. This might prove the saying that people always grow into the person they once despised the most. Young Jonas only had the desire to go home and save everyone from time travel, while the adult Jonas had a mentor-student relationship with the elderly Claudia and tried to stop Adam, who stood on the opposite side of Claudia and wanted to start the end of the world. As a result, Adam ordered Noah to kill her. This might be why Adam shed tears when he learned of the death of the elderly Claudia. If everyone's fate is predetermined, Jonas is destined to grow into his adult self, and no matter how he resists, he will eventually become his older self, Adam. So does the current struggle and resistance really matter? Adult Noah has already seen the last few pages of the notebook, but when his younger self had questions about Noah, he still chose to speak for Adam, because adult Noah regarded Adam as a god. In the timeline of June 25, 1987, Claudia anxiously looked at the obituary announcing her father's unexpected death the next day. Determined, she pushed aside all her work and rushed to her father's home, hoping he could move into her house to change his fate. She then sought out the founder of the nuclear power plant, Helga's father, Bernd, whom she had questioned multiple times about the secrets of the nuclear power plant. His previous answer was nuclear waste. However, after time traveling, she realized it wasn't that simple. Bernd, without much ado, handed her a document. It turned out that during last year's nuclear power plant accident, a magical new particle was discovered beneath the power plant that could overturn people's understanding of the world. Reporting the discovery would inevitably reveal the past accident. With the shadow of the Chernobyl incident still lingering, disclosure would lead to the shutdown of the power plant. As the power plant founder, Bernd firmly forbade this. He didn't care what Claudia did with the new particles, even if she made them public, but only after his death. 
Back at the power plant, Claudia confidentially handed a small tube of the new particles to a reliable inspector, hoping he would analyze its composition and effects and keep it a secret from others. Meanwhile, the elderly Nielsen, since learning that his son Mikkel was in this timeline, attempted to escape from the sanatorium. He seized the opportunity to knock out his caregiver, stole the keys, and escaped. With his aging body, he managed to reach the home of Nurse Ines and finally saw his son, whom he had been longing for 33 years. Nielsen nervously dug his fingers into the wooden table, unsure of how to reveal his identity to Mikkel. Mikkel felt that the old man in front of him was very familiar. Nielsen slowly knocked over a cup and said the problem wasn't how it was done, but when it was done. This was what Mikkel had said to his father on the morning of the day he disappeared. Recognizing his father, he excitedly embraced Nielsen. Nurse Inez stole some sleeping pills from the hospital. When she heard from a colleague that a patient had escaped from the mental hospital, a man who targeted children, she ran home in a panic. At this moment, Nielsen and Mikkel were fleeing to the Winden Cave, hoping to travel back home together. Nurse Inez immediately contacted Sheriff Egon. Everyone started chasing towards the Winden Forest. Just as Nielsen and Mikkel were about to enter the Winden Cave, the police intercepted the two. Nielsen was captured and shoved into a police car. Nurse Inez hugged the somewhat frightened Mikkel. Father and son were forced to separate again. While the police car was taking Nielsen back to the mental hospital, he unexpectedly saw his other two children, Magnus and Martha, and their friends. But he didn't know how the young group got to the year 1987. It turns out that on June 25, 2020, Kathy, after a night of hesitation, decided to reveal the matter of Mikkel to her children. However, her previous obsession with finding Mikkel while neglecting them had deeply upset Martha. Moreover, Bartosz was still left in the Winden Cave. The siblings adamantly refused to communicate with Kathy. The four members of the young group gathered at the entrance of the cave. Elizabeth felt someone was watching her, but she didn't say anything and followed her sister into the cave. Not far from the cave, Noah came out from behind a tree. Bartos initially didn't want to reveal the truth, but seeing the others really leaving him in the cave, he had to spill the beans. The device he carried was a time machine. To prove it, he borrowed Martha's phone to search for a signal, then activated the machine, taking the young group to the year 1987. Exiting the Winden Cave, the appearance of the forest hadn't changed. Seeing the distrustful expressions of the others, Bartos had no choice but to reveal Noah. Franziska immediately associated him with the person Elizabeth had met. Martha only caught the information that Jonas would return. It wasn't until they reached the main road of the town and saw the products of the 80s everywhere that they believed Bartosz's words. On the other side, adult Jonas sneaks into Martha's room. Looking at the photographs of himself with his beloved in the room, he slowly sits on Martha's bed. He then places a necklace on the pillow. Kathy is unable to share her deep concerns with her children, so she visits Hannah's house to find adult Jonas. She sees the scattered photos on the table. One of them shows Kathy, Nielsen, and Hannah together. Hannah deliberately folded Kathy's photo. Since they were young, Hannah has always coveted Kathy's things. Now this woman has taken both her husband and son, which makes Kathy unable to suppress sarcastic feelings. However, Kathy is very confident that Nielsen will never say his love to Hannah. This is the pain in Hannah's heart. At the most awkward moment, the investigator knocks on Hannah's door. He is there to get a record of the missing person case from Hannah. The investigator is still most concerned about Alec's affairs, but he is met with Hannah's indifferent rejection. At this time, adult Jonas and Charlotte are exploring the situation in the bunker. The clockmaker is not Charlotte's biological grandfather, but the man who raised her. She has never seen her biological parents and vaguely feels that it has something to do with time travel. When adult Jonas showed her the time-traveling machine, she thought of her grandfather's heirloom. Charlotte returned to the watch shop to search for the blueprint, but then Noah walked in. Charlotte was slightly scared of this man who had killed many boys. But Noah took out a photograph, in which a young Noah was holding a baby. It turns out Charlotte is Noah's daughter. Noah said that as a premature baby, Charlotte was weak, and the time space she was in could not cure her, so he had to send her away reluctantly. However, an accident happened on the way, and he lost track of her. Noah has been searching for his daughter for many years, even willing to become a puppet and pawn for Adam. In fact, Adam had known all along that Charlotte was Noah's daughter, but kept it a secret. When Noah found out that Charlotte was his daughter, he thought Adam could help them reunite as a family. It wasn't until he got the last few pages of the notebook that he realized the world would end in two days. 
So now Noah decides to kill Adam to change the future. As Noah prepares to leave, Charlotte stops him. She wants to know who her mother really is. Noah does not give a direct answer, only leaving a vague comment that her mother loved her very much, and she still does. Adult Jonas returns home, feeling a bit repelled by Hannah's concern. When everyone is worried about the missing people and trying their best to find them, only Hannah cares about herself. She blames others for her own misfortunes and mourns for not getting her lover. The mother and son part on bad terms. Martha, who returns home late at night, also finds a necklace on her pillow. It's the necklace she shared with Jonas. In 1921, young Jonas wakes up and changes into the clothes Adam prepared for him, which are the yellow raincoat he first wore. After the initial impatience, Jonas finally calms down and carefully listens to Adam speak. Jonas and Adam seem to be trapped in a loop, repeating their fate. No matter how hard they struggle, Jonas will always become Adam in the end. Now Adam has thought of a way to break this cycle. He declares war on time and wants to create a new world without time. Jonas questions Adam. If he really has found a way to break the cycle, why is everyone still experiencing pain? The conversation he's having with Adam now, a young Adam must have experienced it too, but nothing has changed. Adam can only tell him that everything happens in a certain order. Adam takes Jonas to the next room. After many years of effort, he can finally freely control the God particle, forming a black energy entity. This man-made energy entity breaks the 33-year interval limit and can go to any point in time. This is the opportunity to break the cycle. As long as they nip the chaos at its source, they can prevent everything. However, what is the origin of all this? Jonas believes it's June 20th, 2019, the day before his father ended his own life. If he can prevent his father's suicide, then little Mikkel would not time travel, and consequently, no version of other Jonas would exist. By sacrificing himself, others can survive. Jonas is willing to pay such a price. He puts on a radiation suit and steps resolutely into the energy entity, but he doesn't see the cold expression on Adam's face or the tear stains at the corners of his eyes. Adam deliberately guides Jonas into believing that his father's death is the source of everything. However, the bootstrap paradox tells us that once time travel occurs, there is no true origin. If he prevents his father's suicide, he will prevent the start of time travel. But the very existence of the father represents time that has already been altered by time travel. How can Jonas easily break the cycle? The last time Adam shed tears was for the death of the elderly Claudia. This time it's as he watches Jonas leave. Their conversation once mentioned that a person has three lives. One ends when innocence is lost, the second when purity is lost, and the last when life itself ends. Jonas is in the period of innocence in the cycle of life, which implies that Adam might cry for the innocence he is about to lose. The scene then shifts back to the day before Jonas's father terminates himself on June 20th, 2019. For the town of Winden, it's just an ordinary day. Jonas and his friends plan to go swimming by the river. The weather forecast suggests it might rain, so he brings his yellow raincoat. His father, upon seeing that coat, looks shocked, even spilling the cup in his hand. Hannah hopes her husband will accompany her to a party at Kathy's house that night. Middle-aged Mickle awkwardly changes the subject. No one knows what absurd life he has lived through. After having a child, Nielsen hasn't been intimate with Kathy for a long time. This morning, they finally have a chance to rekindle their relationship, but then little Mickle breaks out in a rash. Kathy immediately shifts her attention to their sick son. Nielsen, rejected in his advances, lies back down on the bed. As the current plant director, Alec always pairs his breakfast with the newspaper for added flavor. However, a news article about a murder case from 33 years ago, with the two main culprits still at large, quickens his breath. Alec's wife, Regina, makes mortal enemies with Nielsen and Kathy. Naturally, she would not attend a party to be held at Kathy's house tonight. Instead, she chooses to enjoy a meal at home with her family tonight. Peter only returned home in the morning. His daughters had already gone out to play. Charlotte sat on the sofa, looking at him with accusing eyes. Ever since discovering her husband's infidelity, she refused to speak with him. Peter tried to explain, but it did nothing to soften Charlotte's stance. Annoyed and embarrassed, he blamed his infidelity on his wife's indifference. To this, Charlotte coldly announced that she would be attending a party alone that night. A year later, Jonas had successfully returned to this day. Because he had lived in the future and narrowly escaped hanging, he bore a scar on his neck, which served as a marker distinguishing the two Jonas. As he hesitated on the town street after leaving the church, his parents passed by with their sick brother, Mikkel. The future Jonas stared blankly, trying to fist bump his father. He then learned from them that his current self should be now playing by the lake with his friends. 
By the lake, Magnus and Bartos were telling scary stories about the lake to scare Martha to wet her pants. But Martha didn't care for such childish play, and swam back to the shore to be alone with Jonas, who was at a loss for what to do in the presence of the girl he loved. He fumbled with the sand, accidentally uncovering a small silver coin. Magnus, hiding in the woods to relieve himself, saw a girl floating in another corner of the lake. He was so frightened that he rushed into the lake to rescue her, only to find it was Francisca enjoying nature by herself, stark naked. He was momentarily dumbstruck and only managed to run away after confirming Francisca was safe. Watching the foolish Magnus, Francisca gave a cute smile. Jonas and Martha started to chat and gradually grew affectionate. Just when they were about to confess their feelings, Magnus burst onto the scene to disrupt their smelly moment. Jonas also remembered that he had to leave. Just as Jonas left, the future Jonas covering the scar on his neck slowly approached Martha. At this carefree moment, he bravely expressed his feelings and kissed Martha deeply. He did what his past self could not do. It was not a kiss of lust, but one of deep love and unspeakable farewell. As the sun gradually set, the remaining three friends headed home. Bartosz felt profoundly apologetic, unable to attend the evening party. He stammered praises for Martha's beautiful hair, but Martha's heart was already stolen and filled with thoughts of Jonas. She never grasped the love hidden beneath Bartosz's compliments. Kathy and Nielsen came to Hannah's house to borrow bowls and plates for their party. Hannah gazed at Mikkel's face, somewhat dazed, but didn't probe further. Instead, she shared a flirty smile with Nielsen. Kathy didn't notice anything unusual. The middle-aged Mikkel hid inside the house, watching his parents, not daring to meet them. When little Mikkel came home to use the toilet, he couldn't find the courage to communicate with his youthful self. When night finally fell, Kathy and Nielsen's home was filled with joy. The moment Jonas walked in at this point in time, he was deeply drawn to Martha. The couple greeted their guests and invited them to look at photos. Mikkel fell ill and was quarantined, asking his mother, Kathy, for help. Kathy led her son away from the party, settling him back in his bed. When he asked her to stay with him until he fell asleep, it was a request no mother could deny. Kathy temporarily left her husband and guests, lying down to hold her son. Jonas returned home in the wild wind, seeing his father alive and well. He rushed forward to hug him, crying with emotion. The middle-aged Mikkel thought his son had been wronged somewhere. Jonas held out his fist to bump with his father, just like Mikkel loved to do. The middle-aged Mikkel immediately realized that his son knew the truth. This revelation terrified him, but Jonas quickly embraced and comforted him. When father and son calmed down, Jonas explained why he was there. He hoped his father wouldn't end his life and presented the suicide note. The middle-aged Mikkel looked baffled. He had been avoiding Kathy and Nielsen, hiding in the house and not going out, but he had never thought of killing himself. He opened the letter and scanned his suicide note. Jonas didn't notice his father's changed expression and just held his hand, pleading with him not to give up on life. Jonas asked how Mikkel returned to 1986, but the father's answer was also surprising, saying that someone took him to see it. When Jonas asked who, Mikkel said it was none other than him. Mikkel recalled the truth of the rainy night. Everyone had been running, Jonas had fallen, and Mikkel had lost his way with no one around. Just when he was at a loss, another Jonas appeared, leading him into the Winden Cave and telling him to sleep peacefully until dawn. As dawn broke the next day, Jonas was nowhere to be found. When Mikkel crawled out of the cave, he found himself in the year 1987. For all these years, the father never understood why Jonas had led him to hide in the cave. It wasn't until this morning when he saw his son's yellow jacket and again saw the face of Mikkel. He finally understood that Jonas didn't come here to stop him, but to let him know what he should do. Jonas didn't want to believe it. Clearly, Adam had sent him to prevent all this, but it seemed he had actually facilitated his father's death. However, the father was very calm, believing that God would arrange everything well. His own sacrifice might just be a small part of a huge disaster, and Jonas, no matter what period he was in, might have a significant impact on the disaster. The elderly Claudia suddenly walked into the room. This was the young Jonas's first time seeing her. Claudia quickly answered the father and son's doubts. She claimed to be a follower of light, while Adam was a representative of darkness. Adam had tricked Jonas into coming to trigger everything, to let everything happen as normal. In Claudia's view, Adam had fallen into a frenzy vortex. He didn't want to make amends but to destroy everything forever. Now the forces of darkness and light are at war, and Jonas must confront his future self. 
Such a significant responsibility is too much for him to bear. He simply thought that if he didn't exist all the time, loops could be broken. However, Claudia disagreed. She said she had seen a timeline without Jonas, and it was not a wonderful experience. Jonas's fate was no longer his own, but was tied to all the people in Winden. To save everyone, there will inevitably be sacrifices. His father's suicide was only the smallest price to pay. This conversation further solidified the middle-aged Mikkel's determination to kill himself. The storm has already arrived. Hannah and Nielsen are having a secret rendezvous in the corner of the garden, while Kathy takes care of Mikkel, oblivious to it all. Jonas, at this point in time, exchanges loving glances with his beloved Martha. Peter can't stand the loneliness and seeks solace with the crossdresser. Charlotte returns home, her eyes filled with sadness as she looks at the empty sofa. Franziska is shocked to witness her father's affair in the rain. Magnus looks at Franziska's picture, pining away. Everyone has their own secrets. Everyone is just living through this ordinary day. In the end, the father gently touches Jonas's face, tears in his eyes as he watches him leave with Claudia. He then returns to his studio, glances at the beam, pulls out a piece of paper from the drawer, and sits down to rewrite his suicide note. Jonas takes one last look at this timeline. Perhaps his innocence was killed just like that. In 1921, Adam quietly looks at the necklace in his hand. His time still stuck at the moment he sent Jonas away. Perhaps the tears he shed earlier were not just for the death of his own youthful innocence, but also for pushing his father to death out of necessity. After a brief moment of sentimentality, Adam resumed his cold demeanor. He only cared about the beginning of the next cycle. Standing behind Adam among the sick Mundus members, astonishingly, there was an older Magnus. He didn't understand why they couldn't tell Jonas the truth and had to use deception instead. Adam didn't answer, leaving them only with that tangled mass of dark energy. The paradox of the bootstraps is raised once again. Jonas's time travel was precisely the key that prompted his father's suicide. It's unclear where the origin of this whole thing lies. On the necklace that Jonas and Martha exchanged as a token of their love, there is an engraving of St. Christopher. According to the legend, St. Christopher carried the entire universe, including its creator, indicating that his responsibility and significance were huge. This foreshadows Jonas's fate. In the infinite cycle of time, he plays a significant role and is destined to become a time traveler. Noah and Claudia both divide the battle of time into two camps, and both believe they belong to the side of light. Jonas is now still a pawn. Even in his process of growing into adult Jonas, he exists as a pawn. It will take more than 60 years for him to have a chance to grow into the chess player Adam. On June 26, 2020, the day before the end of the world, adult Jonas wakes up from his sleep, only to find the time travel machine is missing. There's no trace of his mother Hannah anywhere in the house. It seems she took the time machine and left. Suddenly, Martha knocks on the door. Hearing the voice of his beloved girl, adult Jonas is completely at a loss, hesitating for a while before opening the door. This is the first time Martha sees adult Jonas. She doesn't know that the scruffy man standing in front of her is her crush, Jonas. Martha suddenly comes to find Hannah because she wants to share with her the time travel experience. Martha, nervously clutching the necklace, feels that Jonas has returned. Bartosz also wants to share all the secrets with everyone. This statement irritates Martha. The two broke up before, not just because of Jonas and family issues, but also because the sensitive Martha always felt that Bartosz was hiding something from her. Only now she knows that the secret he was hiding concerns Nielsen and his brother, as well as Jonas. These three people are very important in Martha's life. Martha doesn't find Hannah, but the unfamiliar adult Jonas gives her a sense of familiarity. Adult Jonas can't control his emotions and reveals his identity. Martha looks at his familiar yet strange face, tears brimming in her eyes. The two lovers separated by time finally meet. Martha returns the necklace to adult Jonas. Although the man in front of her has aged, she slowly reaches out to touch his face. Suddenly, Kathy fiercely kicks open the door to Hannah's house. Adult Jonas shields Martha behind him. Earlier, Kathy was thinking at home, looking at the loving tattoo on her arm for Nielsen and the clues her husband left in the newspapers. She decides to look for Hannah to get the time machine, but instead sees adult Jonas with her daughter. Kathy immediately pulls Martha behind her. Before knowing the truth, everyone knew that Martha was fond of Jonas. Now, adult Jonas's identity is too awkward. Any further entanglement with her daughter would be a scandal. Kathy has no choice but to tell her daughter that Jonas is actually Mikkel's son, her nephew. Facing the truth leaves Martha stunned. Adult Jonas can only keep apologizing to her. 
Kathy doesn't give them a chance to talk more and directly asks where the time machine and Hannah are, but gets the news that both are gone. Martha immediately realizes that the young group still has one. Kathy then drags her daughter away. Charlotte told her husband Peter that she is the daughter of Noah. The end of the world is tomorrow, and only by staying in the bunker can they survive. The couple sat on the sofa in silence, lost for words. Franziska brought her boyfriend and her little sister home and told her parents about the time traveling. After hearing the news, Peter and Charlotte kept their calm, which made her realize that her parents had known about it for a while. Before Franziska could explode, Magnus received a call from his sister saying that adult Jonas was back. However, Peter and Charlotte were already aware of all this and had tried to prevent their two daughters from getting involved. The thing teenage girls and boys hate the most is when parents keep secrets and treat them like children. Franziska had been harboring resentment due to her father's gay affair and the pretense of a perfect marriage with her mother. When she found out that her parents were acting nonchalant about such an important matter, she stormed out of the house in anger. Magnus went home with the time machine. Kathy is excited to open the machine, but none of the three of them knew how to operate it. Kathy took the machine back to her room upstairs to study. Martha happily told her brother that their brother Mikkel and father Nielsen were still alive, just living in another time. Meanwhile, the body of the elderly Claudia was found in 1954. The cause of death was a gunshot to the chest. However, a large amount of radioactive radiation was detected on her body. Officer Egon remembered her appearing in his office not long ago, at the exact time when little Helgig returned home. His colleagues suspected that the elderly Claudia might be related to the Helga kidnapping case. Officer Egan took a picture of Claudia to Helga's family, asking little Helga if he recognized her, in an attempt to determine whether she was a criminal. Little Helga claimed that someone had told him about Claudia, but he remained tight-lipped about who she was. Little Helga referred to Claudia as the White Devil, who wanted to kill everyone in the town. Officer Egon reassured Little Helgig that the White Devil was already dead and that everyone was safe. However, Little Helg expressed some doubts, stating that Claudia hasn't started yet. Hearing this, a look of fear crossed Officer Egon's face. Officer Egon returned to the police station with a lingering fear. Hannah was already waiting for him in the office. It turned out that Hannah had traveled to this era with the time machine. She knew that Nielsen was here. She pretended to be searching for her husband, hoping to confirm whether he was the culprit the police had caught. When Officer Egon asked Hannah for her name, she hesitated and said her name was Kathy. Nielsen was now locked in a mental hospital. People took his claims of saving all the children as gibberish. Hannah followed Officer Egon there and managed to get the chance to speak with Nielsen alone. When Nielsen saw Hannah, he was excited, but what he blurted out had to do with his wife Kathy and his three children. Hannah's face changed. She asked Nielsen if he had ever told her he loved her. Nielsen understood that this was his only chance for salvation. Without hesitation, he expressed his love to her. Hannah finally heard what she wanted to hear the most, but she realized that she was nothing more than a spice in Nielsen's life, and she could never compare to Kathy. Hannah decisively turned around and left, claiming she didn't know this madman, so Nielsen lost his chance to escape. Officer Egon took Hannah back to the police station, anxiously asking whether she was about to leave. Hannah calmly lit a cigarette, declaring she didn't need a husband, lover, or spouse anymore. She would stay in this era and start anew. Seeing the stunning woman, Officer Egon eagerly lit her cigarette. Hannah gave Officer Egon a seductive smile, and ambiguous undercurrents swirled in the smoky air. In the 1987 timeline, middle-aged Claudia spent the whole night studying the God Particle. By the time she came back to her senses, it was the morning of June 26th, the date Sheriff Egon's death was reported in the newspaper. Claudia immediately packed her things and demanded that Sheriff Egon move into her house. Sheriff Egon was about to go to the hospital for his first chemotherapy treatment, and Claudia anxiously offered to accompany him. Sheriff Egon was pleased that his daughter wanted to get close to him. Perhaps it was because he hadn't interacted with his daughter for a long time, or perhaps his illness had made him weak. So Sheriff Egon told his daughter about his youth, when he captured Nielsen, and the recent accidental discovery of possible time travel. Claudia tried hard to avoid this topic because she knew about time travel. This was related to the God particles released from the nuclear power plant. Nielsen wanted to enter the Winden Cave 33 years ago and now. Sheriff Egon believed that there must be secrets in the cave. Claudia cut off her father's words abruptly. As a police officer with keen intuition, Sheriff Egon realized that his daughter knew about this and wanted to hide the truth for the nuclear power plant. He called the police force, hoping to search the Winden Cave, but unfortunately was pushed and fell during the argument with his daughter. His head hit the corner of the table, causing a pool of blood. 
Claudia tried to call for an ambulance but gave up the moment the call connected. Changing the present meant changing the future. Between saving her daughter at the end of the world and saving her father now, Claudia chose to abandon her father. At the last moment before death, Sheriff Egon connected all the dots and realized that Claudia was the White Devil. Claudia sat next to her father's body until late into the night, then returned to her house in a daze. Looking at the blood of her father in her hands, Claudia tried to wash off the bloodstains. However, the cruel reality of witnessing her father's death became an indelible shadow. She collapsed on the ground and began to cry. After that, Jonas appeared before Claudia. After learning the truth about her father's suicide, Jonas had been following the elderly Claudia, learning all there was to know about time travel, including the life of Claudia, who had no choice but to kill her father. Now, he followed his fate and led the middle-aged Claudia towards her destiny. In 2020, the parents and the children's groups finally exchanged information. Now, time travel was no longer the unspeakable secret of every family. However, compared to other families, the desperate Hannah chose to stay in 1954 and restarted her life. Just as adult Jonas said, Hannah always cared only about herself. The ambiguous atmosphere between her and Officer Egon could be the reason for the future rift between Claudia and her father. It seemed like Hannah would add even more chaos to this town with its already complicated family relations. By far, the reason why the investigator came to town also became clear. It was related to the plant director, Alec, and the robbery and murder case 33 years ago. It turns out, the fake identity Alec had originally used was that of the investigator's younger brother. After searching for his brother for so many years, the investigator finally received an anonymous letter not long ago and came to Winden Town to catch Alec. Now, Alec is locked in the police station, unable to return to the nuclear power plant to work. In the deep voice of middle-aged Noah, Elizabeth from 2053 unearths a photo buried underground, revealing a shocking secret she's been hiding. Charlotte is not only her mother, but also the daughter Elizabeth bore with Noah. This paradoxical truth is more baffling than the chicken or the egg conundrum. Middle-aged Noah, aware of Adam's true intentions, is on the brink of executing Adam. However, Noah doesn't reveal this to his young self, because he knows changing one's past self prevents becoming one's present self. Middle-aged Noah silently sends his young self off to the apocalypse of 2020. Noah hands the last few missing pages of the brown notebook to Adam. Adam wants to destroy the current world and create a new one, an idea Noah can't accept. However, at the crucial moment, his gun jams. Adam, indifferent to Noah's threats, has learned over the years that to gain freedom, one must completely free oneself from emotional control, even if it means sacrificing their most treasured possession. Noah, still emotionally attached to his daughter Charlotte, hesitates for a moment, and Agnes, who has rejoined Adam's ranks, appears suddenly and kills her brother Noah without hesitation. On June 27, 2020, the day of the apocalypse, adult Jonas comes to Martha's house with a gun, asking her to leave with him. She looks at his familiar yet strange face and chooses to reject him. Left with no choice, adult Jonas takes her to the bunker in the Winden Cave with the threat of his gun. Kathy, with a time machine in hand, arrives at Jonas's house and scavenges a handheld flashlight and the most important map of the Winden Caves from his backpack. She's about to leave when she sees her son's photo album and sits down quietly. When adult Jonas returns home, Kathy quickly composes herself and asks him how to use the time machine. She wants to bring her son Mikkel back. He tells her it's impossible because destiny has been fixed. Angry and frustrated, Kathy questions why adult Jonas returned to this time. He finally reveals his purpose. He may not be able to prevent himself from becoming Adam, but he can try to stop his younger self from becoming him. Regina was hit by the arrest of her husband Alec. Seeing his mother in this desolate state, Bartos tells her about the elderly Claudia's visit and shows her a photo of her and Claudia, conveying her regrets. Regina is emotionally moved by the photo. Alec is imprisoned for identity theft. The investigator couldn't find evidence that Alec killed his brother, but he suspects Alec is behind the town's disappearances. He secures a search warrant for the nuclear power station from the government. Alec hopes that Blindfold Man can help him escape. However, Blindfold Man is helpless, believing that the exposure of nuclear waste is not necessarily a bad thing. Inside the Winden Caves in 1987, Jonas is explaining the next steps to the middle-aged Claudia. He has been learning from the elderly Claudia for a full year. In her camp, they hold a belief that major events can't be changed, but minor ones can. When accumulated, small actions may be able to alter the future. 
Although adult Jonas didn't break the time loop initially, he did manage to close the portal. In the eyes of the elderly Claudia, this was a minor change. Jonas believes he can do better next time and instills this concept in the middle-aged Claudia. Jonas takes out a tube of material from the nuclear waste drum and inserts it into the time machine. He is about to open the time portal again. As the machine operates, time appears as tangible particles forming a time particle stream in the bunker. Simultaneously, all the light tubes start to flicker and countless birds fall dead from the sky. The anomaly of the opening of the time portal once again sweeps across the entire town. Soon after, Jonas and the middle-aged Claudia travel to 2020. Jonas puts down the time machine, instructs Claudia to take it to the bunker, and he goes to look for his mother and Martha. Kathy senses the anomaly and immediately runs towards the Winden Caves with her equipment, leaving behind the time machine. Meanwhile, Peter can't contact his wife and older daughter Franziska and has to rush Elizabeth into the bunker. Martha takes this opportunity to run away. Bartos finds Magnus and Francisca, intending to retrieve the time machine. He is beginning to doubt himself, feeling as though he is merely a tool for Noah. Francisca gives him a wake-up call, suggesting that his role may be to inform their friends on how to use the machine. Bartos is worried and immediately leads the others to retrieve the machine. However, Kathy's house is empty. Francisca receives a text message from her father, asking them all to take refuge in the bunker. Magnus decides to wait at home for half an hour longer. If his mother and sister don't return, he will go to the bunker. Young Noah has arrived in the year 2020. One of his tasks is to find adult Jonas and dissuade him from his desire to kill Adam. He then pulls out a letter from his pocket, claiming it's written by Martha. Upon reading the letter's contents, adult Jonas exclaims in disbelief, but Noah remains composed. He insists that Jonas must save their friends, as well as Noah's siblings, because this cycle must end for the next one to begin, and only then will his beloved Martha survive. Adult Jonas immediately takes the time machine and rushes to Magnus's house. On the other hand, Martha, after rushing out of the bunker, arrives at Hannah's house only to encounter the young Jonas. The two, who have been longing for each other, cannot resist their love, even after learning the whole truth. They were meant for each other and would never believe anything else. This statement might be the best footnote for their forbidden love. However, their smelly moment doesn't last long as Adam appears. He calmly states that everything done now is to transform Jonas into the future Adam. He ends up shooting Martha to make the young Jonas grow into Adam due to hatred or the hope of saving Martha. Meanwhile, the investigator begins investigating the nuclear power plant, insisting on entering the workshop where nuclear waste is buried. Looking at the newly laid cement, he is convinced that Alec has buried the bodies of the missing people beneath it and orders the workers to dig it up. Officer Charlotte, failing to find the investigator at the police station, learns his whereabouts from Blindfold Man. She takes Blindfold Man to the nuclear power plant and informs him about time travel. It's only then that Blindfold Man realizes that it's not just the nuclear waste that's problematic. By the time Charlotte arrives, the investigator has already opened the yellow barrel, revealing a lot of black substance inside. At this point, adult Jonas arrives at Magnus's house. He knows in his heart that Martha should be dead by now. All he can do now is follow the words in the letter, start the time machine, and save Magnus, Franziska, and Bartosz. At the same time, Elizabeth in the year 2053 and Magnus and Franziska in 1921 all activate their machines. The energy bodies from different times begin to stabilize. In 2020, the god particle rises within the nuclear power plant, forming an energy body before disappearing. Lost in the Winden Cave, Kathy follows the time particles and finally finds the door to the time-space passage. In the bunker, apart from Peter and Elizabeth, Claudia also brings her daughter to take refuge. The last person to open the bunker turns out to be young Noah. Inside the plant, the door to the time-space passage opens again. Elizabeth on the other end and Charlotte on this end both involuntarily walk towards each other. Charlotte understands from the hand gestures that the woman standing in front of her is her daughter. Above the plant, a large energy body gradually forms. Everyone is waiting for this moment. When the hands of mother and daughter connect, the dark energy body envelops the entire town. The young Jonas, still at home, helplessly looks at Martha's body. Suddenly, a woman appears who looks exactly like Martha. The new Martha doesn't have time to explain much. She pulls out a more advanced, compact time-space machine and starts it. When Jonas asks her which time she comes from, she says the issue is not which time space, but which world. She then leaves with Jonas. The town is covered by a surge of black fog, and here concludes season two of this drama. 
As a review, Adam was desperately trying to destroy the world and was not truly insane. He was hoping to destroy this world to create a new one. In the new world, everyone would break free from the time loop and his beloved Martha could survive. So adult Jonas, who was waiting at home with a gun to kill Adam, changed his mind after reading a letter from Martha and decided to save his friends instead. Perhaps this is a necessary step for his future transformation into Adam. Two seasons of the plot are paving the way for us, emphasizing that fate has a predetermined ending and trajectory. Everyone has obsessions. Adam is desperate to save Martha, Kathy wants to find her husband Nielsen, while Hannah wants Nielsen's love. These obsessions lead them to enter the time loop to save the people in their hearts, but they ultimately become slaves to the time loop. They always believe that they can find a way to save everyone by traveling through time and space, but unwittingly, they are walking towards the most painful ending prescribed by fate. Adam tells Noah that to gain freedom one must sacrifice the most precious thing, so he kills Martha to ignite the obsession in young Jonas's heart. But in the end, his ultimate goal is still to save Martha. Just like the elderly Claudia, her ultimate goal is to protect her daughter Regina. The methods of the two are not comparable in terms of who is right or wrong, because the fate of the entire town of Winden is so unpredictable. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.